Chapter One of the Permanent Husband. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley. The Permanent Husband by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Frederick Wishaw. Chapter One summer had come and velchaninoff contrary to his expectations was still in st petersburg his trip to the south of russia had fallen through and there seemed no end to the business which had detained him this business which was a lawsuit as to certain property had taken a very disagreeable aspect three months ago the thing had appeared to be by no means complicated in fact there had seemed to be scarcely any question as to the rights and wrongs of the matter but all seemed to change suddenly everything else seems to have changed for the worse too said velchaninoff to himself over and over again he was employing a clever lawyer an eminent man and an expensive one too but in his impatience and suspicion he began to interfere in the matter himself he read and wrote papers all of which the lawyer put into his waste-paper basket holus bolus called in continually at the courts and offices made inquiries and confused and worried everybody concerned in the matter so at least the lawyer declared and begged him for mercy's sake to go away to the country somewhere but he could not make up his mind to do so he stayed in town and enjoyed the dust and the hot nights and the closeness of the air of st petersburg things which are enough to destroy anyone's nerves his lodgings were somewhere near the great theatre he had lately taken them and did not like them nothing went well with him his hypochondria increased with each day and he had long been a victim to that disorder velchaninoff was a man who had seen a great deal of the world he was not quite young, thirty-eight years old, perhaps thirty-nine or so, and all this old age, as he called it, had fallen upon him quite unawares. However, as he himself well understood, he had aged more in the quality than in the number of the years of his life, and if his infirmities were really creeping upon him, they must have come from within and not from outside causes. He looked young enough still he was a tall stout man with light brown thick hair without a suspicion of white about it and a light beard that reached halfway down his chest at first sight you might have supposed him to be of a lax careless disposition or character but on studying him more closely you would have found that on the contrary the man was decidedly a stickler for the proprieties of this world and withal brought up in the ways and graces of the very best society his manners were very good free but graceful in spite of this lately acquired habit of grumbling and reviling things in general he was still full of the most perfect aristocratic self-confidence probably he did not himself suspect to how great an extent this was so though he was a most decidedly intelligent i may say clever even talented man his open healthy-looking face was distinguished by an almost feminine refinement which quality gained him much attention from the fair sex he had large blue eyes eyes which ten years ago had known well how to persuade and attract such clear merry careless eyes they had been that they invariably brought over to his side any person he wished to gain now when he was nearly forty years old their ancient kind frank expression had died out of them and a certain cynicism a cunning an irony very often and yet another variety of expression of late an expression of melancholy or pain undefined but keen had taken the place of the earlier attractive qualities of his eyes this expression of melancholy especially showed itself when he was alone and it was a strange fact that the gay careless happy fellow of a couple of years ago the man who could tell a funny story so inimitably should now love nothing so well as to be all alone he intended to throw up most of his friends a quite unnecessary step in spite of his present financial difficulties probably his vanity was to blame for this intention he could not bear to see his old friends in his present position 
with his vain suspicious character it would be most unpalatable to him but his vanity began to change its nature in solitude it did not grow less on the contrary but it seemed to develop into a special type of vanity which was unlike its old self this new vanity suffered from entirely different causes higher causes if i may so express it he said and if there really be higher and lower motives in this world he defined these higher things as matters which he could not laugh at or turn to ridicule when happening in his own individual experience of course it would be quite another thing with the same subjects in society by himself he could not ridicule them but put him among other people and he would be the first to tear himself from all of those secret resolutions of his conscience made in solitude and laugh them to scorn very often on rising from his bed in the morning he would feel ashamed of the thoughts and feelings which had animated him during the long sleepless night and his nights of late had been sleepless he seemed suspicious of everything and everybody great and small and grew mistrustful of himself one fact stood out clearly and that was that during those sleepless nights his thoughts and opinions took huge leaps and bounds sometimes changing entirely from the thoughts and opinions of the daytime this fact struck him very forcibly and he took occasion to consult an eminent medical friend he spoke in fun but the doctor informed him that the fact of feelings and opinions changed during meditations at night and during sleeplessness was one long recognized by science and that that was especially the case with persons of strong thinking power and of acute feelings he stated further that very often the beliefs of a whole life are uprooted under the melancholy influence of night and inability to sleep and that often the most fateful resolutions are made under the same influence that sometimes this impressionability to the mystic influence of the dark hours amounted to a malady in which case measures must be taken the radical manner of living should be changed diet considered a journey undertaken if possible etc etc velchaninoff listened no further but he was sure that in his own case there was decided malady very soon his morning meditations began to partake of the nature of those of the night but they were more bitter certain events of his life now began to recur to his memory more and more vividly they would strike him suddenly and without apparent reason things which had been forgotten for ten or fifteen years some so long ago that he thought it miraculous that he should have been able to recall them at all but that was not all for after all what man who has seen any life has not hundreds of such recollections of the past the principal point was that all this past came back to him now with an absolutely new light thrown upon it and he seemed to look at it from an entirely new and unexpected point of view why did some of his acts appear to him now to be nothing better than crimes it was not merely in the judgment of his intellect that these things appeared so to him now had it been only his poor sick mind he would not have trusted it but his whole being seemed to condemn him he would curse and even weep over these recollections of the past if any one had told him a couple of years since that he would weep over anything he would have laughed the idea to scorn at first he recalled the unpleasant experiences of his life certain failures in society humiliations he remembered how some designing person had so successfully blackened his character that he was requested to cease his visits to a certain house how once and not so very long ago he had been publicly insulted and had not challenged the offender how once an epigram had been fastened to his name by some witty person in the midst of a party of pretty women and he had not found a reply he remembered several unpaid debts and how he had most stupidly run through two very respectable fortunes then he began to recall facts belonging to a higher order he remembered that he had once insulted a poor old grey-headed clerk and that the latter had covered his face with his hands and cried which velchaninoff had thought a great joke at the time but now looked upon in quite another light 
then he thought how he had once merely for fun set a scandal going about the beautiful little wife of a certain schoolmaster and how the husband had got to hear the rumour he velchaninoff had left the town shortly after and did not know how the matter had ended but now he fell to wondering and picturing to himself the possible consequences of his action and goodness knows where this theme would not have taken him to if he had not suddenly recalled another picture that of a poor girl whom he had been ashamed of and never thought of loving but whom he had betrayed and forsaken her and her child when he left st petersburg he had afterwards searched for this girl and her baby for a whole year but never found them of this sort of recollections there were alas but too many and each one seemed to bring along with it a train of others his vanity began to suffer little by little under these memories i have said that his vanity had developed into a new type of vanity there were moments few albeit in which he was not even ashamed of having no carriage of his own now or of being seen by one of his former friends in shabby clothes or when if seen and looked at by such a person contemptuously he was high-minded enough to suppress even a frown of course such moments of self-oblivion were rare but as i said before his vanity began little by little to change away from its former quarters and to centre upon one question which was perpetually ranging itself before his intellect there is some power or other he would muse sarcastically somewhere which is extremely interested in my morals and sends me these damnable recollections and tears of remorse let them come by all means but they have not the slightest effect on me for i haven't a scrap of independence about me in spite of my wretched forty years i know that for certain why if it were to happen so that i should gain anything by spreading another scandal about that schoolmaster's wife for instance that she had accepted presents from me or something of that sort i should certainly spread it without a thought but though no other opportunity ever did occur of maligning the schoolmistress yet the very thought alone that if such an opportunity were to occur he would inevitably seize it was almost fatal to him at times he was not tortured with memory at every moment of his life he had intervals of time to breathe and rest in but the longer he stayed the more unpleasant did he find his life in st petersburg july came in at certain moments he felt inclined to throw up his lawsuit and all and go down to the crimea but after an hour or so he would despise his own idea and laugh at himself for entertaining it these thoughts won't be driven away by a mere journey down south he said to himself when they have once begun to annoy me besides if i am easy in my conscience now i surely need not try to run away from any such worrying recollections of past days why should i go after all he resumed in a strain of melancholy philosophizing this place is a very heaven for a hypochondriac like myself what with the dust and the heat and the discomfort of this house what with the nonsensical swagger and pretence of all these wretched little civil servants in the departments i frequent every one is delightfully candid and candour is undoubtedly worthy of all respect i won't go away i'll stay and die here rather than go End of chapter one chapter two of the permanent husband by fyodor dostoevsky this librivox recording is in the public domain it was the third of july the heat and closeness of the air had been quite unbearable the day had been a busy one for velchaninoff he had been walking and driving about without rest and he had still in prospect a visit in the evening to a certain state councillor who lived somewhere on the chornaya richka black stream and whom he was anxious to drop in upon unexpectedly at six o'clock our hero issued from his house once more and trudged off to dine at a restaurant on the nevsky near the police bridge a second-rate sort of place but french here he took his usual corner and ordered his usual dinner and waited 
He always had a rouble dinner, and paid for his wine extra, which moderation he looked upon as a discreet sacrifice to the temporary financial embarrassment under which he was suffering. He regularly went through the ceremony of wondering how he could bring himself to eat such nastiness, and yet as regularly he demolished every morsel, and with excellent show of appetite, too, just as though he had eaten nothing for three days. "'This appetite can't be healthy,' he murmured to himself sometimes, observing his own voracity. However, on this particular occasion he sat down to his dinner in a miserably bad humour. He threw his hat angrily away somewhere, tipped his chair back, and reflected. He was in the sort of humour that if his next neighbour, dining at the little table near him, were to rattle his plate, or if the boy serving him were to make any little blunder, or, in fact, if any little petty annoyance were to put him out of a sudden, he was quite capable of shouting at the offender, and, in fact, kicking up a serious row on the smallest pretext. Soup was served to him. He took up his spoon, and was about to commence operations, when he suddenly threw it down again, and started from his seat. An unexpected thought had struck him, and in an instant he had realized why he had been plunged in gloom and mental perturbation during the last few days. Goodness knows why he thus suddenly became inspired, as it were, with the truth. But so it was. He jumped from his chair, and in an instant it all stood out before him as plain as his five fingers. "'It's all that hat,' he muttered to himself. "'It's all simply and solely that damnable round hat with the crape band round it. That's the reason and cause of all my worries these last days.' He began to think, and the more he thought, the more dejected he became and the more astonishing appeared the remarkable circumstance of the hat. But hang it all, there is no circumstance, he growled to himself. What circumstance do I mean? There's been nothing in the nature of an event or occurrence? The fact of the matter was, nearly a fortnight since, he had met for the first time, somewhere about the corner of the Podacheskia, a gentleman with crape round his hat. There was nothing particular about the man, he was just like all others. But as he passed Velchaninoff, he had stared at him so fixedly that it was impossible to avoid noticing him, and more than noticing, observing him attentively. The man's face seemed to be familiar to Velchaninoff. He had evidently seen him somewhere, and at some time or other. But one sees thousands of people during one's life, thought Velchaninoff one can't remember every face. So he had gone on his way, and before he was twenty yards further, to all appearances he had forgotten all about the meeting, in spite of the strength of the first impression made upon him. And yet he had not forgotten, for the impression remained all day, and a very original impression it was, too, a kind of objectless feeling of anger against he knew not what. He remembered his exact feelings at this moment, a fortnight after the occurrence, how he had been puzzled by the angry nature of his sentiments at the time, and puzzled to such an extent that he had never for a moment connected his ill-humour with the meeting of the morning, though he had felt as cross as possible all day. But the gentleman with the crape band had not lost much time about reminding Belchaninoff of his existence, for the very next day he met the latter again on the Nevsky Prospect and again he had stared in a peculiarly fixed way at him. Velchaninoff flared up and spat on the ground in irritation, Russian-like, but a moment after he was wondering at his own wrath. There are faces, undoubtedly, he reflected, which fill one with disgust at first sight, but I certainly have met that fellow somewhere or other. Yes, I have met him before, he muttered again, half an hour later and again, as on the last occasion, he was in a vile humour all that evening, and even went so far as to have a bad dream in the night, and yet it never entered his head to imagine that the cause of his bad temper on both occasions had been the accidental meeting with the gentleman in mourning, although on the second evening he had remembered and thought of the chance encounter two or three times. 
He had even flared up angrily to think that such a dirty-looking cad should presume to linger in his memory so long. He would have felt it humiliating to himself to imagine for a moment that such a wretched creature could possibly be in any way connected with the agitated condition of his feelings. Two days later the pair had met once more at the landing-place of one of the small Neva ferry-steamers. On the third occasion Velchaninoff was ready to swear that the man recognised him, and had pressed through the crowd towards him, had even dared to stretch out his hand and call him by name. As to this last fact, he was not quite certain, however. At all events, who the deuce is he? thought Velchaninoff, and why can't the idiot come up and speak to me if he really does recognise me, and if he so much wishes to do so? With these thoughts, Velchaninoff had taken a droshky and started off for the Smoly Monastery, where his lawyer lived. Half an hour later he was engaged in his usual quarrel with that gentleman. But that same evening he was in a worse humour than ever, and his night was spent in fantastic dreams and imaginings, which were anything but pleasant. "'I suppose it's bile,' he concluded, as he paid his matutinal visit to the looking-glass. This was the third meeting. Then, for five days, there was not a sign of the man, and yet, much to his distaste, Velchaninoff could not, for the life of him, avoid thinking of the man with the crape band. He caught himself musing over the fellow. "'What have I to do with him?' he thought. "'What can his business in St. Petersburg be? He looks busy, and whom is he in mourning for?' He clearly recognises me, but I don't know in the least who he is. And why do such people as he is put crape on their hats? It doesn't seem the thing for them, somehow. I believe I shall recognise this fellow if I ever get a good close look at him. And there came over him that sensation we all know so well, the same feeling that one has when one can't for the life of one think of the required word. Every other word comes up associations with the right word come up, occasions when one has used the word come up. One wanders round and round the immediate vicinity of the word wanted, but the actual word itself will not appear, though you may break your head to get at it. Let's see now. It was, yes, some while since. It was, where on earth was it? There was a, oh, devil take whatever there was or wasn't there. What does it matter to me? He broke off angrily of a sudden. I'm not going to lower myself by thinking of a little cad like that. He felt very angry, but when, in the evening, he remembered that he had been so upset and recollected the cause of his anger, he felt the disagreeable sensation of having been caught by someone doing something wrong. This fact puzzled and annoyed him. There must be some reason for my getting so angry at the mere recollection of that man's face, he thought, but he didn't finish thinking it out. But the next evening he was still more indignant, and this time he really thought with good cause. Such audacity is unparalleled, he said to himself. The fact of the matter is, there had been a fourth meeting with the man of the crepe hat-band. The latter had apparently arisen from the earth and confronted him but let me explain what had happened. It so chanced that Velchaninoff had just met, accidentally, that very state councillor mentioned a few pages back, whom he had been so anxious to see, and on whom he had intended to pounce unexpectedly at his country house. This gentleman evidently avoided Velchaninoff, but at the same time was most necessary to the latter in his lawsuit. Consequently, when Velchaninoff met him, the one was delighted, while the other was very much the reverse. Velchaninoff had immediately buttonholed him, and walked down the street with him, talking, doing his very utmost to keep the sly old fox to the subject on which it was so necessary that he should be pumped. And it was just at this most important moment, when Velchaninoff's intellect was all on the qui vive, to catch up the slightest hints of what he wished to get at while the foxy old councillor, aware of the fact, was doing his best to reveal nothing, that the former, taking his eyes from his companion's face for one instant, 
beheld the gentleman of the crape hat band walking along the other side of the road and looking at him nay watching him evidently and apparently smiling devil take him said velchaninoff bursting out into fury at once while the old fox instantly disappeared and i should have succeeded in another minute curse that dirty little hound he's simply spying on me i'll i'll hire somebody to i'll take my oath he laughed at me damn him i'll thrash him i wish i had a stick with me i'll i'll buy one i won't leave this matter so who the deuce is he i will know who is he at last three days after this fourth encounter we find velchaninoff sitting down to dinner at his restaurant as recorded a page or two back in a state of mind bordering upon the furious he could not conceal the state of his feelings from himself in spite of all his pride he was obliged to confess at last that all his anxiety his irritation his state of agitation generally must undoubtedly be connected with and absolutely attributed to the appearance of the wretched-looking creature with the crape hat-band in spite of his insignificance i may be a hypochondriac he reflected and i may be inclined to make an elephant out of a gnat but how does it help me what use is it to me if i persuade myself to believe that perhaps all this is fancy why if every dirty little wretch like that is to have the power of upsetting a man like myself why it's it's simply unbearable undoubtedly at this last fifth encounter of to-day the elephant had proved himself a very small gnat indeed the crape man had appeared suddenly as usual and had passed by velchaninoff but without looking up at him this time indeed he had gone by with downcast eyes and had even seemed anxious to pass unobserved velchaninoff had turned rapidly round and shouted as loud as ever he could at him hey he cried you crape hat band you want to escape notice this time do you who are you both the question and the whole idea of calling after the man were absurdly foolish and velchaninoff knew it the moment he had said the words the man had turned round stopped for an instant lost his head smiled half made up his mind to say something had waited half a minute in painful indecision then twisted suddenly round again and bolted without a word Velchaninoff gazed after him in amazement. "'What if it be I that haunt him, and not he me, after all?' he thought. However, Velchaninoff ate up his dinner, and then drove off to pounce upon the town councillor at the latter's house, if he could. The councillor was not in, and he was informed that he would scarcely be at home before three or four in the morning, because he had gone to a names-day party velchaninoff felt that this was too bad in his rage he determined to follow and hunt the fellow up at the party he actually took a droshky and started off with that wild idea but luckily he thought better of it on the way got out of the vehicle and walked away towards the great theatre near which he lived he felt that he must have motion also he must absolutely sleep well this coming night in order to sleep he must be tired so he walked all the way home, a fairly long walk, and arrived there about half-past ten, as tired as he could wish. His lodging, which he had taken last March, and had abused ever since, apologising to himself for living in such a hole, and at the same time excusing himself for the fact by the reflection that it was only for a while, and that he had dropped quite accidentally into St. Petersburg, thanks to that cursed lawsuit, his lodging i say was by no means so bad as he made it out to be the entrance certainly was a little dark and dirty-looking being just under the arch of the gateway but he had two fine large light rooms on the second floor separated by the entrance hall one of these rooms overlooked the yard and the other the street leading out of the former of these was a smaller room meant to be used as a bedroom but Velchaninoff had filled it with a disordered array of books and papers, and preferred to sleep in one of the large rooms, the one overlooking the street, to wit. His bed was made for him every day upon the large divan. 
The rooms were full of good furniture, and some valuable ornaments and pictures were scattered about, but the whole place was in dreadful disorder, the fact being that at this time Velchaninoff was without a regular servant. His one domestic had gone away to stay with her friends in the country. He thought of taking a man, but decided it was not worth while for a short time. Besides, he hated flunkies, and ended by making arrangements with his dvornik's sister, Martha, who was to come up every morning and do out his rooms, he leaving the key with her as he went out each day. Martha did absolutely nothing towards tidying the place, and robbed him besides, but he didn't care. He liked to be alone in the house. But solitude is all very well within certain limits, and Belchaninov found that his nerves could not stand all this sort of thing at certain bilious moments, and it so fell out that he began to loathe his room more and more every time he entered it. However, on this particular evening, he hardly gave himself time to undress. He threw himself on his bed, and determined that nothing should make him think of anything, and that he would fall asleep at once. And, strangely enough, his head had hardly touched the pillow before he actually was asleep, and this was the first time for a month past that such a thing had occurred. He awoke at about two, considerably agitated. He had dreamed certain very strange dreams, reminding him of the incoherent wanderings of fever. The subject seemed to be some crime which he had committed and concealed, but of which he was accused by a continuous flow of people who swarmed into his rooms for the purpose. The crowd which had already collected within was enormous, and yet they continued to pour in in such numbers that the door was never shut for an instant. But his whole interest seemed to centre in one strange-looking individual, a man who seemed to have once been very closely and intimately connected with him, but who had died long ago and now reappeared for some reason or other. The most tormenting part of the matter was that Velchaninoff could not recollect who this man was. He could not remember his name, though he recollected the fact that he had once dearly loved him. All the rest of the people swarming into the room seemed to be waiting for the final word of this man. Either the condemnation or the justification of Velchaninoff was to be pronounced by him, and every one was impatiently waiting to hear him speak but he sat motionless at the table, and would not open his lips to say a word of any sort. The uproar continued, the general annoyance increased, and, suddenly, Velchaninoff himself strode up to the man in a fury, and smote him because he would not speak. Velchaninoff felt the strangest satisfaction in having thus smitten him. His heart seemed to freeze in horror for what he had done, and in acute suffering for the crime involved in his action. But in that very sensation of freezing, at the heart lay the sense of satisfaction which he felt. Exasperated more and more, he struck the man a second and a third time, and then, in a sort of intoxication of fury and terror, which amounted to actual insanity, and yet bore within it a germ of delightful satisfaction, he ceased to count his blows, and reined them in without ceasing. He felt he must destroy, annihilate, demolish all this. Suddenly something strange happened. Everyone present had given a dreadful cry, and turned expectantly towards the door, while at the same moment there came three terrific peals of the hall bell, so violent that it appeared someone was anxious to pull the bell-handle out. Velchaninoff awoke, started up in a second, and made for the door. He was persuaded that the ring at the bell had been no dream or illusion, but that someone had actually rung, and was at that moment standing at the front door. It would be too unnatural if such a clear and unmistakable ring should turn out to be nothing but an item of a dream, he thought but to his surprise it proved that such was nevertheless the actual state of the case. He opened the door and went out on to the landing. He looked downstairs and about him, but there was not a soul to be seen. The bell hung motionless. Surprised, but pleased, he returned into his room. 
he lit a candle and suddenly remembered that he had left the door closed but not locked and chained he had often returned home before this evening and forgotten to lock the door behind him without attaching any special significance to the fact his maid had often respectfully protested against such neglect while with him he now returned to the entrance hall to make the door fast before doing so he opened it however and had one more look about the stairs he then shut the door and fastened the chain and hook but did not take the trouble to turn the key in the lock some clock struck half-past two at this moment so that he had had three hours sleep more or less his dream had agitated him to such an extent that he felt unwilling to lie down again at once he decided to walk up and down the room two or three times first just long enough to smoke a cigar having half dressed himself he went to the window drew the heavy curtains aside and pulled up one of the blinds it was almost full daylight these light summer nights of st petersburg always had a bad effect upon his nerves and of late they had added to the causes of his sleeplessness so that a few weeks since he had invested in these thick curtains which completely shut out the light when drawn close having thus let in the sunshine quite oblivious of the lighted candle on the table he commenced to walk up and down the room still feeling the burden of his dream upon him its impression was even now at work upon his mind he still felt a painful guilty sensation about him caused by the fact that he had allowed himself to raise his hand against that man and strike him but my dear sir he argued with himself it was not a man at all the whole thing was a dream what's the use of worrying yourself for nothing Velchaninoff now became obstinately convinced that he was a sick man and that to his sickly state of body was to be attributed all his perturbation of mind he was an invalid it had always been a weak point with Velchaninoff that he hated to think of himself as growing old or infirm and yet in his moments of anger he loved to exaggerate one or the other in order to worry himself it's old age he now muttered to himself as he paced up and down the room i'm becoming an old fogey that's the fact of the matter i'm losing my memory see ghosts and have dreams and hear bells ring curse it all i know these dreams of old they always herald fever with me i dare swear that the whole business of this man with the crape hat band has been a dream too i was perfectly right yesterday he isn't haunting me the least bit in the world it is i that am haunting him i've invented a pretty little ghost story about him and then climb under the table in terror at my own creation why do i call him a little cad too he may be a most respectable individual for all i know his face is a disagreeable one certainly though there is nothing hideous about it he dresses just like anyone else i don't know there's something about his look there i go again what the devil have i got to do with his look what a fool i am just as though i could not live without the dirty little wretch curse him among other thoughts connected with this haunting crape man was one which puzzled Velchaninoff immensely he felt convinced that at some time or other he had known the man and known him very intimately and that now the latter when meeting him always laughed at him because he was aware of some great secret of his former life or because he was amused to see Velchaninoff's present humiliating condition of poverty mechanically our hero approached the window in order to get a breath of fresh air when he was suddenly seized with a violent fit of shuddering a feeling came over him that something unusual and unheard of was happening before his very eyes he had not had time to open the window when something he saw caused him to slip behind the corner of the curtain and hide himself the man in the crape hat-band was standing on the opposite side of the street he was standing with his face turned directly towards Velchaninoff's window but evidently unaware of the latter's presence there and was carefully examining the house and apparently considering some question connected with it he seemed to come to a decision after a moment's thought and raised his finger to his forehead 
Then he looked quietly about him, and ran swiftly across the road on tiptoe. He reached the gate, and entered it. This gate was left open on summer nights until two or three in the morning. "'He's coming to me,' muttered Velchaninoff, and with equal caution he left the window, and ran to the front door. Arrived in the hall, he stood in breathless expectation before the door, and placed his trembling hand carefully upon the hook which he had fastened a few minutes since, and stood listening for the tread of the expected footfall on the stairs. His heart was beating so loud that he was afraid he might miss the sound of the cautious steps approaching. He could understand nothing of what was happening, but it seemed clear that his dream was about to be realized. Velchaninoff was naturally brave. He loved risk for its own sake, and very often ran into useless dangers, with no one by to see, to please himself. But this was different somehow. He was not himself, and yet he was as brave as ever, but with something added. He made out every movement of the stranger from behind his own door. Ah! There he comes. He's on the steps now. Here he comes. He's up now. Now he's looking downstairs, and all about, and crouching down. Aha! There's his hand on the door-handle. He's trying it. He thought he would find it unlocked. Then he must know that I do leave it unlocked sometimes. He's trying it again. I suppose he thinks the hook may slip. He doesn't care to go away without doing anything. So ran Velchaninoff's thoughts, and so indeed followed the man's actions. There was no doubt about it. Someone was certainly standing outside and trying the door-handle, carefully and cautiously pulling at the door itself, and, in fact, endeavouring to effect an entrance. Equally sure was it that the person so doing must have his own object in trying to sneak into another man's house at dead of night. But Velchaninoff's plan of action was laid, and he awaited the proper moment. He was anxious to seize a good opportunity, slip the hook and chain, open the door wide, suddenly, and stand face to face with this bugbear, and then ask him what the deuce he wanted there. No sooner devised than executed. Awaiting the proper moment, Velchaninoff suddenly slipped the hook, pushed the door wide, and almost tumbled over the man with the crape hat-band. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Permanent Husband by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The crape man stood rooted to the spot, dumb with astonishment. Both men stood opposite one another on the landing, and both stared in each other's eyes, silent and motionless. So passed a few moments, and suddenly, like a flash of lightning, Velchaninoff became aware of the identity of his guest. At the same moment the latter seemed to guess that Velchaninoff had recognized him. Velchaninoff could see it in his eyes. In one instant the visitor's whole face was ablaze with its very sweetest of smiles. "'Surely I have the pleasure of speaking to Alexey Ivanovitch?' he asked, in the most dulcet of voices, comically inappropriate to the circumstances of the case. "'Surely you are Pavel Pavlovitch Pruzotsky? asked Velchaninoff in return, after a pause, and with an expression of much perplexity. "'I had the pleasure of your acquaintance ten years ago at tea. And, if I may remind you of the fact, we were almost intimate friends.' "'Quite so. Oh, yes. But it is now three o'clock in the morning, and you have been trying my lock for the last ten minutes.' Three o'clock!' cried the visitor, looking at his watch with an air of melancholy surprise. "'Why, so it is! Dear me! Three o'clock! Forgive me, Alexey Ivanovitch! I ought to have found it out before thinking of paying you a visit. I will do myself the honour of calling to explain another day. And now I—' "'Oh, no! No, no! If you are to explain at all, let's have it at once, this moment!' interrupted Velchaninoff warmly. Kindly step in here, into the room. You must have meant to come in, you know. You didn't come here at night like this, simply for the pleasure of trying my lock. 
he felt excited, and at the same time was conscious of a sort of timidity. He could not collect his thoughts. He was ashamed of himself for it. There was no danger, no mystery about the business, nothing but the silly figure of Pavel Pavlovitch. And yet he could not feel satisfied that there was nothing particular in it. He felt afraid of something to come, he knew not what or when. However, he made the man enter, seated him in a chair, and himself sat down on the side of his bed, a yard or so off, and rested his elbows on his knees while he quietly waited for the other to begin. He felt irritated. He stared at his visitor and let his thoughts run. Strangely enough, the other never opened his mouth. He seemed to be entirely oblivious of the fact that it was his duty to speak. Nay, he was even looking inquiringly at Velchaninoff, as though quite expecting that the latter would speak to him. Perhaps he felt a little uncomfortable at first, somewhat as a mouse must feel when he finds himself unexpectedly in the trap. Velchaninoff very soon lost his patience. "'Well,' he cried, "'you are not a fantasy or a dream or anything of that kind, are you? You aren't a corpse, are you? Come, my friend, this is not a game or play. I want your explanation, please.' The visitor fidgeted about a little, smiled, and began to speak cautiously. "'So far as I can see,' he said, "'the time of night of my visit is what surprises you, and that I should have come as I did. In fact, when I remember the past, and our intimacy, and all that, I am astonished myself. But the fact is, I did not mean to come in at all. And if I did so, it was purely an accident.' "'An accident?' Why, I saw you creeping across the road on tiptoes. You saw me? Indeed. Come, then you know as much or more about the matter than I do. But I see I am annoying you. This is how it was. I've been in town three weeks or so on business. I am Pavel Pavlovich Trusotsky. You recognize me yourself. My business in town is to effect an exchange of departments. I am trying for a situation in another place, one with a large increase of salary. But all this is beside the point. The fact of the matter is, I believe I have been delaying my business on purpose. I believe if everything were settled at this moment, I should still be dawdling in this St. Petersburg of yours in my present condition of mind. I go wandering about as though I had lost all interest in things, and were rather glad of the fact, in my present condition of mind. "'What condition of mind?' asked Velchaninoff, frowning. The visitor raised his eyes to Velchaninoff's, lifted his hat from the ground beside him, and with great dignity pointed out the black crape band. "'There, sir, in that condition of mind,' he observed. Velchaninoff stared stupidly at the crape, and thence at the man's face. Suddenly his face flushed up in a hot blush for a moment, and he was violently agitated. Not Natalia Vasilievna, surely. Yes, Natalia Vasilievna. Last March. Consumption, sir. And almost suddenly. All over in two or three months. And here am I left as you see me. So saying, Pavel Pavlovitch, with much show of feeling, bent his bald head down, and kept it bent for some ten seconds, while he held out his two hands, in one of which was the hat with the band, in explanatory emotion. This gesture, and the man's whole air, seemed to brighten Velchaninoff up. He smiled sarcastically for one instant, not more at present, for the news of this lady's death, he had known her so long ago, and had forgotten her many a year since had made a quite unexpected impression upon his mind. "'Is it possible?' he muttered, using the first words that came to his lips. "'And pray, why did you not come here and tell me at once?' "'Thanks for your kind interest. I see and value it, in spite of—' "'In spite of what?' "'In spite of so many years of separation, you at once sympathized with my sorrow, and in fact with myself, and so fully, too.' that I feel naturally grateful. That's all I had to tell you, sir. Don't suppose I doubt my friends, you know. Why, even here, in this place, I could put my finger on several very sincere friends indeed. For instance, Stepan Mikhailovich Bagantov. But remember, my dear Alexey Ivanovitch, 
Nine years have passed since we were acquaintances, or friends, if you'll allow me to say so, and meanwhile you have never been to see us, never written. The guest sang all this out as though he were reading it from music, and kept his eyes fixed on the ground the while, although, of course, he saw what was going on above his eyelashes exceedingly well all the same. Belchaninov had found his head by this time. With a strange sort of fascinated attention, which strengthened itself every moment, he continued to gaze at and listen to Pavel Pavlovitch, and of a sudden, when the latter stopped speaking, a flood of curious ideas swept unexpectedly through his brain. "'But look here!' he cried. "'How is it that I never recognized you all this while? We've met five times, at least, in the streets.' "'Quite so. I am perfectly aware of the circumstance. You chanced to meet me two or three times, and—' "'No, no, you met me, you know, not I, you!' Belchaninov suddenly burst into a roar of laughter, and rose from his seat. Pavel Pavlovitch paused a moment, looked keenly at Belchaninov, and then continued. "'As to your not recognizing me, in the first place you might easily have forgotten me by now.' and besides, I have had smallpox since last we met, and I dare say my face is a good deal marked. Smallpox? Why, how did you manage that? He has had it, though, by Jove!" cried Velchaninov. What a funny fellow you are! However, go on, don't stop. Velchaninov's spirits were rising higher and higher. He was beginning to feel wonderfully light-hearted. That feeling of agitation, which had lately so disturbed him, had given place to quite a different sentiment. He now began to stride up and down the room very quickly. "'I was going to say,' resumed Pavel Pavlovitch, "'that though I have met you several times, and though I quite intended to come and look you up when I was arranging my visit to Petersburg, still I was in that condition of mind, you know, and my wits have so suffered since last March that wits since last march yes go on wait a minute do you smoke oh you know natalia vasilievna never quite so but since march eh well i might a cigarette or so here you are then light up and go on go on you interest me wonderfully velchaninov lit a cigar and sat down on his bed again pavel pavlovitch paused a moment but what a state of agitation you seem to be in yourself said he are you quite well oh curse my health cried velchaninov you go on the visitor observed his host's agitation with satisfaction he went on with his share of the talking with more confidence what am i to go on about he asked imagine me alexey ivanovitch a broken man not simply broken but gone at the root as it were a man forced to change his whole manner of living, after twenty years of married life, wandering about the dusty roads without an object, mind lost, almost oblivious of his own self, and yet, as it were, taking some sort of intoxicated delight in his loneliness. Isn't it natural that if I should, at such a moment of self-forgetfulness, come across a friend, even a dear friend, I might prefer to avoid him for that moment? and isn't it equally natural that at another moment i should long to see and speak with someone who has been an eye-witness of or a partaker so to speak in my never-to-be-recalled past and to rush not only in the day but at night if it so happens to rush to the embrace of such a man yes even if one has to wake him up at three in the morning to do it i was wrong in my time not in my estimate of my friend though for at this moment I feel the full rapture of success. My rash action has been successful. I have found sympathy. As for the time of night, I confess I thought it was not twelve yet. You see, one sups of grief, and it intoxicates one. At least, not grief exactly, it's more the condition of mind, the new state of things that affects me. Dear me, how oddly you express yourself, said Velchaninov rising from his seat once more, and becoming quite serious again. "'Oddly, do I? Perhaps.' "'Look here, are you joking?' 
joking cried pavel pavlovitch in shocked surprise joking at the very moment when i am telling you of oh be quiet about that for goodness sake Velchaninoff started off on his journey up and down the room again so matters stood for five minutes or so the visitor seemed inclined to rise from his chair but Velchaninoff bade him sit still and pavel pavlovitch obediently flopped into his seat again how changed you are said the host at last stopping in front of the other chair as though suddenly struck with the idea fearfully changed wonderful you're quite another man that's hardly surprising nine years sir no 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 years have nothing to do with it it's not in appearance you are so changed it's something else well sir the nine years might account for anything perhaps it's only since march eh <laughs> you are playful sir said pavel pavlovitch laughing slyly but if i may ask it wherein am i so changed oh why you used to be such a staid sober correct pavel pavlovitch such a wise pavel pavlovitch and now you're a good-for-nothing sort of pavel pavlovitch Velchaninoff was in that state of irritation when the steadiest gravest people will sometimes say rather more than they mean good for nothing am i and wise no longer i suppose eh chuckled pavel pavlovitch with disagreeable satisfaction wise indeed my dear sir i'm afraid you are not sober replied Velchaninoff, and added to himself i am pretty fairly insolent myself but i can't compare with this little cad and what on earth is the fellow driving at oh my dear good my best of alexey ivanovitches said the visitor suddenly most excitedly and twisting about on his chair and why should i be sober we are not moving in the brilliant walks of society you and i just now we are but two dear old friends come together in the full sincerity of perfect love to recall and talk over that sweet mutual tie of which the dear departed formed so treasured a link in our friendship so saying the sensitive gentleman became so carried away by his feelings that he bent his head down once more to hide his emotion and buried his face in his hat Velchaninoff looked on with an uncomfortable feeling of disgust i can't help thinking the man is simply silly he thought and yet no no his face is so red he must be drunk but drunk or not drunk what does the little wretch want with me that's the puzzle do you remember or don't you remember our delightful little evenings dancing sometimes or sometimes literary at simeon simeonovitch's continued the visitor gradually removing his hat from before his face and apparently growing more and more enthusiastic over the memories of the past and our little readings you and she and myself and our first meeting when you came in to ask for information about something connected with your business in the town and commenced shouting angrily at me don't you remember when suddenly in came natalia vasilievna and within ten minutes you were our dear friend and so remained for exactly a year just like turgenev's story the provincialka Velchaninoff had continued his walk up and down the room during this tirade with his eyes on the ground listening impatiently and with disgust but listening hard all the same it never struck me to think of the provincialka in connection with the matter he interrupted and look here why do you talk in that sneaking whining sort of voice you never used to do that your whole manner is unlike yourself quite so quite so i used to be more silent i know i used to love to listen while others talked you remember how well the dear departed talked the wit and grace of her conversation as to the provincialka i remember she and i used often to compare your friendship for us to certain episodes in that piece and especially to the doings of one stupendif it really was remarkably like that character and his doings what stupendif do you mean confound it all cried Velchaninoff, stamping his foot with rage the name seemed to have evoked certain most irritating thoughts in his mind 
why stupendif don't you know the husband in provincialka whined pavel pavlovitch in the very sweetest of tones but that belongs to another set of fond memories after you departed in fact when mr bagantov had honoured us with his friendship just as you had done before him only that his lasted five whole years bagantov what bagantov do you mean that same bagantov who was serving down in your town why he also yes yes quite so he also he also cried the enthusiastic pavel pavlovitch seizing upon velchaninoff's accidental slip of course so that there you are there's the whole company bagantov played the count the dear departed was the provincialka and i was the husband only that the part was taken away from me for incapacity i suppose yes fancy you a stupendif you're a you're first a pavel pavlovitch trusotsky said velchaninoff contemptuously and very unceremoniously but look here bagantov is in town i know he is for i have seen him why don't you go to see him as well as myself my dear sir i have been there every day for the last three weeks he won't receive me he's ill and can't receive and do you know i have found out that he really is very ill fancy my feelings a five years friend oh my dear alexey ivanovitch you don't know what my feelings are in my present condition of mind i assure you at one moment i long for the earth to open and swallow me up and the next i feel that i must find one of those old friends eye-witnesses of the past as it were if only to weep on his bosom only to weep sir give you my word well that's about enough for to-night don't you think so said velchaninoff cuttingly oh too too much cried the other rising it must be four o'clock and here am i agitating your feelings in the most selfish way now look here i shall call upon you myself and i hope that you will then but tell me honestly are you drunk to-night drunk not the least in the world did you drink nothing before you came here or earlier do you know my dear alexey ivanovitch you are quite in a high fever good-night i shall call to-morrow and i have noticed it all the evening really quite delirious continued pavel pavlovitch licking his lips as it were with satisfaction as he pursued this theme i am really quite ashamed that i should have allowed myself to be so awkward as to agitate you well well i'm going now you must lie down at once and go to sleep you haven't told me where you live shouted velchaninoff after him as he left the room oh didn't i pokrovsky hotel pavel pavlovitch was out on the stairs now stop cried velchaninoff once more you are not running away are you how do you mean running away asked pavel pavlovitch turning round at the third step and grinning back at him with his eyes staring very wide open instead of replying velchaninoff banged the door fiercely locked and bolted it and went fuming back into his room arriving there he spat on the ground as though to get rid of the taste of something loathsome he then stood motionless for at least five minutes in the centre of the room after which he threw himself upon his bed and fell asleep in an instant the forgotten candle burned itself out in its socket End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Permanent Husband » by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Belchaninoff slept soundly until half-past nine, at which hour he started up, sat down on the side of his bed, and began to think his thoughts quickly fixed themselves upon the death of that woman the agitating impression wrought upon his mind by yesterday's news as to her death had left a painful feeling of mental perturbation this morning the whole of the events of nine years back stood out before his mind's eye with extraordinary distinctness he had loved this woman natalia vasilievna 
Trzotsky's wife, he had loved her, and had acted the part of her lover during the time which he had spent in their provincial town, while engaged in business connected with a legacy. He had lived there a whole year, though his business did not require by any means so long a visit. In fact, the tie above mentioned had detained him in the place. He had been so completely under the influence of this passion, that Natalia Vasilievna had held him in a species of slavery. He would have obeyed the slightest whim, or the wildest caprice of the woman, at that time. He had never, before or since, experienced anything approaching the infatuation she had caused. When the time came for departing, Velchaninoff had been in a state of such absolute despair, though the parting was to have been but a short one, that he had begged Natalia Vasilievna to leave all and fly across the frontier with him. And it was only by laughing him out of the idea, though she had at first encouraged it herself, probably for a joke, and by unmercifully chaffing him, that the lady eventually persuaded Belchaninoff to depart alone. However, he had not been a couple of months in St. Petersburg before he found himself asking himself that question which he had never to this day been able to answer satisfactorily, namely, did he love this woman at all, or was it nothing but the infatuation of the moment? He did not ask this question because he was conscious of any new passion taking root in his heart. On the contrary, during those first two months in town, he had been in that condition of mind that he had not so much as looked at a woman, though he had met hundreds, and had returned to his old society ways at once. And yet he knew perfectly well that if he were to return to T, he would instantly fall into the meshes of his passion for Natalia Vasilievna once more, in spite of the question for which he could not answer as to the reality of his love for her. Five years later he was as convinced of this fact as ever, although the very thought of it was detestable to him, and although he did not remember the name of Natalia Vasilievna but with loathing. He was ashamed of that episode at T. He could not understand how he, Velchaninoff, could ever have allowed himself to become the victim of such a stupid passion. He blushed whenever he thought of the shameful business, blushed, and even wept for shame. He managed to forget his remorse after a few more years. He felt sure that he had lived it down. And yet now, after nine years, here was the whole thing resuscitated by the news of Natalia's death. At all events, however, now, as he sat on his bed with agitating thoughts swarming through his brain, he could not but feel that the fact of her being dead was a consolation, amidst all the painful reflections which the mention of her name had called up. "'Surely I am a little sorry for her?' he asked himself. Well, he certainly did not feel that sensation of hatred for her now. He could think of her and judge her now without passion of any kind, and therefore more justly. He had long since been of opinion that in all probability there had been nothing more in Natalia Vasilievna than is to be found in every lady of good provincial society, and that he himself had created the whole fantasy of his worship and her worshipfulness. But though he had formed this opinion, he always doubted its correctness, and he still felt that doubt now. Facts existed to contradict the theory. For instance, this Bagantov had lived for several years at T, and had been no less a victim to passion for this woman, and had been as helpless as Velchaninoff himself under her witchery. Bagantov, though a young idiot, as Velchaninoff expressed it, was nevertheless a scion of the very highest society in St. Petersburg. His career was in St. Petersburg, and it was significant that such a man should have wasted five important years of his life at T, simply out of love for this woman. It was said that he had only returned to Petersburg, even then, because the lady had had enough of him, so that, all things considered, there must have been something which rendered Natalia Vasilievna preeminently attractive among women. Yet the woman was not rich, she was not even pretty if not absolutely plain. Velchaninoff had known her when she was twenty-eight years old. Her face was capable of taking a pleasing expression, but her eyes were not good, they were too hard. 
She was a thin, bony woman to look at. Her mind was intelligent, but narrow and one-sided. She had tact and taste, especially as to dress. Her character was firm and overbearing. She was never wrong, in her own opinion, or unjust. The unfaithfulness towards her husband never caused her the slightest remorse. She hated corruption, and yet she was herself corrupt. And she believed in herself absolutely. Nothing could ever have persuaded her that she herself was actually depraved. Velchaninoff believed that she really did not know that her own corruption was corrupt. He considered her to be one of those women who only exist to be unfaithful wives. Such women never remain unmarried. It is the law of their nature to marry. Their husband is their first lover, and he is always to blame for anything that may happen afterwards. The unfaithful wife herself, being invariably absolutely in the right, and of course perfectly innocent. So thought Velchaninoff, and he was convinced that such a type of woman actually existed. But he was no less convinced that there also existed a corresponding type of men, born to be the husbands of such women. In his opinion, the mission of such men was to be, so to speak, permanent husbands, that is, to be husbands all their lives, and nothing else. Velchaninoff had not the smallest doubt as to the existence of these two types, and Pavel Pavlovich Trusotsky was, in his opinion, an excellent representative of the male type. Of course, the Pavel Pavlovich of last night was by no means the same Pavel Pavlovich as he had known at T. He had found an extraordinary change in the man, and yet, on reflection, he was bound to admit that the change was but natural, for that he could only have remained what he was so long as his wife lived, and that now he was but a part of a whole, allowed to wander at will, that is, an imperfect being, a surprising, an incomprehensible sort of a thing, without proper balance. As for the Pavel Pavlovich of T, this is what Velchaninoff remembered of him. Pavel Pavlovich had been a husband, of course, a formality, and that was all. If, for instance, he was a clerk of department besides, he was so merely in his capacity of, and as a part of his responsibility as, a husband. He worked for his wife, and for her social position. He had been thirty-five years old at that time, and was possessed of some considerable property. He had not shown any special talent, nor, on the other hand, any marked incapacity in his professional employment. His position had been decidedly a good one. Natalia Vasilyevna had been respected and looked up to by all. Not that she valued their respect in the least. She considered it merely as her due. She was a good hostess, and had schooled Pavel Pavlovich into polite manners, so that he was able to receive and entertain the very best society passably well. He might be a clever man, for all Velchaninoff knew, but as Natalia Vasilyevna did not like her husband to talk much, there was little opportunity of judging. He may have had good qualities as well as bad, but the good ones were, so to speak, kept put away in their cases, and the bad ones were stifled and not allowed to appear. Velchaninoff remembered, for instance, that Pavel Pavlovich had once or twice shown a disposition to laugh at those about him, but this unworthy proclivity had been very promptly subdued. He had been fond of telling stories, but this was not allowed either, or, if permitted at all, the anecdote was to be of the shortest and most uninteresting description. Pavel Pavlovich had a circle of private friends outside the house, with whom he was fain, at times, to taste the flowing bowl. But this vicious tendency was radically stamped out as soon as possible. And yet, with all this, Natalia Vasilyevna appeared, to the uninitiated, to be the most obedient of wives, and doubtless considered herself so. Pavel Pavlovich may have been desperately in love with her. No one could say as to this. Velchaninoff had frequently asked himself during his life at T, whether Pavel Pavlovich ever suspected his wife of having formed the tie with himself, of which mention has been made. Velchaninoff had several times questioned Natalia Vasilyevna on this point, seriously enough. 
but had invariably been told with some show of annoyance that her husband neither did know nor ever could know and that all there might be to know was not his business another trait in her character was that she never laughed at pavel pavlovitch and never found him funny in any sense and that she would have been down on any person who dared to be rude to him at once pavel pavlovitch's reference to the pleasant little readings enjoyed by the trio nine years ago was accurate they used to read dickens novels together Belchaninov or Trozatsky reading aloud, while Natalia Vasilievna worked. The life at tea had ended suddenly, and so far as Velchaninov was concerned, in a way which drove him almost to the verge of madness. The fact is, he was simply turned out, although it was all managed in such a way that he never observed that he was being thrown over like an old worn-out shoe. A young artillery officer had appeared in the town a month or so before Velchaninov's departure, and had made acquaintance with the Trusatskys. The trio became a quartet. Before long, Velchaninov was informed that for many reasons a separation was absolutely necessary. Natalia Vasilievna adduced a hundred excellent reasons why this had become unavoidable, and especially one which quite settled the matter. After his stormy attempt to persuade Natalia Vasilievna to fly with him to Paris, or anywhere, Velchaninov had ended by going to St. Petersburg alone, for two or three months at the very most, as he said. Otherwise he would refuse to go at all, in spite of every reason and argument Natalia might adduce. Exactly two months later Velchaninov had received a letter from Natalia Vasilievna, begging him to come no more to tea because she already loved another. As to the principal reason which she had brought forward in favour of his immediate departure, she now informed him that she had made a mistake. Velchaninov remembered the young artillery man, and understood, and so the matter had ended once and for all. A year or two after this Bogantov appeared at tea, and an intimacy between Natalia Vasilievna and the former had sprung up which lasted for five years. This long period of constancy Velchaninov attributed to advancing age on the part of Natalia. He sat on the side of his bed for nearly an hour and thought. At last he roused himself, rang for Mavra and his coffee, drank it off quickly, dressed, and punctually at eleven was on his way to the Prokofsky Hotel. He felt rather ashamed of his behaviour to Pavel Pavlovitch last night. Belchaninov put down all that phantasmagoria of the trying of the lock and so on to Pavel Pavlovitch's drunken condition and to other reasons, but he did not know why he was now on his way to make fresh relations with the husband of that woman, since their acquaintanceship and intercourse had come to so natural and simple a termination. Yet something seemed to draw him thither, some strong current of impulse, and he went. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Permanent Husband by Fyodor Dostoevsky This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Pavel Pavlovitch was not thinking of running away, and goodness knows why Velchaninov should have asked him such a question last night. He did not know himself why he had said it. He was directed to the Petrovsky Hotel, and found the building at once. At the hotel he was told that Pavel Pavlovitch had now engaged a furnished lodging in the back part of the same house. Mounting the dirty and narrow stairs indicated, as far as the third story, he suddenly became aware of someone crying. It sounded like the weeping of a child of some seven or eight years of age. It was a bitter, but a more or less suppressed sort of crying, and with it came the sound of a grown man's voice, apparently trying to quiet the child, anxious that its sobbing and crying should not be heard, and yet only succeeding in making it cry the louder. The man's voice did not seem in any way sympathetic with the child's grief, and the latter appeared to be begging for forgiveness. Making his way into a narrow dark passage with two doors on each side of it, Velchaninov met a stout-looking elderly woman, in very careless morning attire, and inquired for Pavel Pavlovitch. 
She tapped the door with her fingers in response to his inquiry, the same door, apparently, whence issued the noises just mentioned. Her fat face seemed to flush with indignation as she did so. "'He appears to be amusing himself in there,' she said, and proceeded downstairs. Belchaninoff was about to knock, but thought better of it, and opened the door without ceremony. In the very middle of a room furnished with plain but abundant furniture, stood Pavel Pavlovitch in his shirt-sleeves, very red in the face, trying to persuade a little girl to do something or other, and using cries and gestures and what looked to Velchaninoff very like kicks in order to effect his purpose. The child appeared to be some seven or eight years of age, and was poorly dressed in a short black stuff frock. She seemed to be in a most hysterical condition, crying and stretching out her arms to Pavel Pavlovitch, as though begging and entreating him to allow her to do whatever it might be she desired. On Belchaninoff's appearance the scene changed in an instant. No sooner did her eyes fall on the visitor than the child made for the door of the next room with a cry of alarm, while Pavel Pavlovitch, thrown out for one little instant, immediately relaxed into smiles of great sweetness, exactly as he had done last night, when Belchaninoff suddenly opened his front door and caught him standing outside. "'Alexey Ivanovitch!' he cried in real surprise. "'Who ever would have thought it? Sit down, sit down, take the sofa, or this chair. Sit down, my dear sir. I'll just put on—' And he rushed for his coat and threw it on, leaving his waistcoat behind. "'Don't stand on ceremony with me,' said Belchaninoff, sitting down. "'Stay as you are.' "'No, sir, no, excuse me, I insist upon standing on ceremony. There, now, I'm a little more respectable. Dear me, now, who ever would have thought of seeing you here? Not I, for one.' Pavel Pavlovitch sat down on the edge of a chair, which he turned so as to face Velchaninoff. "'And pray, why shouldn't you have expected me? I told you last night that I was coming this morning.' I thought you wouldn't come, sir. I did indeed. In fact, when I thought over yesterday's visit, I despaired of ever seeing you again. I did indeed, sir." Velchaninoff glanced round the room meanwhile. The place was very untidy. The bed was unmade, the clothes thrown about the floor. On the table were two coffee tumblers, with the dregs of coffee still in them, and a bottle of champagne half-finished, with a tumbler standing alongside it. He glanced at the next room, but all was quiet there. The little girl had hidden herself, and was still as a mouse. "'You don't mean to say you drink that stuff at this time of day?' he asked, indicating the champagne bottle. "'It's only a remnant,' explained Pavel Pavlovitch, a little confused. "'My word, you are a changed man!' "'Bad habit, sir, and all of a sudden. All dating from that time, sir give you my word, I couldn't resist it. But I'm all right now. I'm not drunk. I shan't talk twaddle as I did last night. Don't be afraid, sir. It's all right. From that very day, sir, give you my word it is. And if anyone had told me half a year ago that I should become like this, if they had shown me my face in a glass then, as I should be now, I should have given them the lie, sir. I should indeed." Hm, then you were drunk last night. Yes, I was, admitted Pavel Pavlovitch, a little guiltily. Not exactly drunk, a little beyond drunk. I tell you this by way of explanation, because I'm always worse after being drunk. If I'm only a little drunk, still the violence and unreasonableness of intoxication come out afterwards, and stay out, too. And then I feel my grief the more keenly. I dare say my grief is responsible for my drinking. I am capable of making an awful fool of myself and offending people when I'm drunk. I dare say I seemed strange enough to you last night? Don't you remember what you said and did? Assuredly I do. I remember everything. Listen to me, Pavel Pavlovitch. I have thought it over and have come to very much the same conclusion as you did yourself," began Velchaninoff gently. Besides, I believe I was a little too irritable towards you last night, too impatient. I admit it gladly. The fact is, I am not very well sometimes, and your sudden arrival, 
you know in the middle of the night in the middle of the night you are quite right it was said pavel pavlovitch wagging his head assentingly how in the world could i have brought myself to do such a thing i shouldn't have come in though if you hadn't opened the door i should have gone as i came i called on you about a week ago and did not find you at home and i dare say i should never have called again for i am rather proud alexey ivanovitch in spite of my present state whenever i have met you in the streets i have always said to myself what if he doesn't know me and rejects me nine years is no joke and i did not dare try you for fear of being snubbed yesterday thanks to that sort of thing you know he pointed to the bottle i didn't know what time it was and it's lucky you are the kind of man you are alexey ivanovitch or i should despair of preserving your acquaintance after yesterday you remember old times alexey ivanovitch velchaninoff listened keenly to all this the man seemed to be talking seriously enough and even with some dignity and yet he had not believed a single word that pavel pavlovitch had uttered from the very first moment that he entered the room tell me pavel pavlovitch said velchaninoff at last i see you are not quite alone here whose little girl is that i saw when i came in pavel pavlovitch looked surprised and raised his eyebrow but he gazed back at velchaninoff with candour and apparent amiability whose little girl why that's our liza he said smiling affably what liza asked velchaninoff and something seemed to cause him to shudder inwardly the sensation was dreadfully sudden just now on entering the room and seeing liza he had felt surprised more or less but had not been conscious of the slightest feeling of presentiment indeed he had had no special thought about the matter at the moment why our liza our daughter liza repeated pavel pavlovitch smiling your daughter do you mean to say that you and natalia vasilievna had children asked velchaninoff timidly and in a very low tone of voice indeed of course but what a fool i am how in the world should you know providence sent us the gift after you had gone pavel pavlovitch jumped off his chair in apparently pleasurable excitement i heard nothing of it said velchaninoff looking very pale how should you how should you repeated pavel pavlovitch with ineffable sweetness we had quite lost hope of any children as you may remember when suddenly heaven sent us this little one and oh my feelings heaven alone knows what i felt just a year after you went i think no wait a bit not a year by a long way let's see you left us in october or november didn't you i left t on the twelfth of september i remember well hm september was it dear me well then let's see september october november december january february march april to the eighth of may that was liza's birthday eight months all but a bit and if you could only have seen the dear departed how rejoiced show her to me call her in the words seemed to tear themselves from velchaninoff whether he liked it or no certainly this moment cried pavel pavlovitch forgetting that he had not finished his previous sentence or ignoring the fact and he hastily left the room and entered the small chamber adjoining three or four minutes passed by while velchaninoff heard the rapid interchange of whispers going on and an occasional rather loud sound of liza's voice apparently entreating her father to leave her alone so velchaninoff concluded at last the two came out there you are she's dreadfully shy and proud said pavel pavlovitch just like her mother liza entered the room without tears but with eyes downcast her father leading her by the hand she was a tall slight and very pretty little girl she raised her large blue eyes to the visitor's face with curiosity but only glanced surlily at him and dropped them again there was that in her expression that one always sees in children when they look on some new guest for the first time retiring to a corner and looking out at him thence seriously and mistrustingly only that there was a something in her manner beyond the usual childish mistrust so at least thought velchaninoff 
her father brought her straight up to the visitor. "'There! This gentleman knew mother very well. He was our friend. You mustn't be shy. Give him your hand.' The child bowed slightly, and timidly stretched out her hand. "'Natalia Vasilievna never would teach her to curtsy. She liked to bow, English fashion, and give her hand,' explained Pavel Pavlovitch, gazing intently at Velchaninoff. Velchaninoff knew perfectly well that the other was keenly examining him at this moment, but he made no attempt to conceal his agitation. He sat motionless on his chair, and held the child's hand in his, gazing into her face the while. But Liza was apparently much preoccupied, and did not take her eyes off her father's face. She listened timidly to every word he said. Velchaninoff recognized her large blue eyes at once, but what specially struck him was the refined pallor of her face, and the colour of her hair. These traits were altogether too significant in his eyes. Her features, on the other hand, and the set of her lips, reminded him keenly of Natalia Vasilievna. Meanwhile, Pavel Pavlovitch was in the middle of some apparently most interesting tale, one of great sentiment seemingly, but Velchaninoff did not hear a word of it until the last few words struck upon his ear. "'So that you can't imagine what our joy was when Providence sent us this gift, Alexey Ivanovitch. She was everything to me for I felt that it should be the will of heaven to deprive me of my other joy. I should still have Liza left to me. That's what I felt, sir. I did indeed." "'And Natalia Vasilievna?' asked Velchaninoff. "'Oh, Natalia Vasilievna,' began Pavel Pavlovitch, smiling with one side of his mouth, "'she never used to like to say much, as you know yourself. But she told me on her deathbed. Deathbed! You know, sir, to the very day of her death she used to get so angry, and say that they were trying to cure her with a lot of nasty medicines, when she had nothing the matter but a simple little feverish attack. And then when Koch arrived, you remember our old doctor Koch? He would make her all right in a fortnight. Why, five hours before she died, she was talking of fixing that day three weeks for a visit to her aunt, Liza's godmother, at her country place. Velchaninoff here started from his seat, but still held the child's hand. He could not help thinking that there was something reproachful in the girl's persistent stare in her father's face. "'Is she ill?' he asked hurriedly, and his voice had a strange tone in it. "'No, I don't think so,' said Pavel Pavlovitch. "'But you see our way of living here, and all that. She's a strange child, and very nervous, besides.' After her mother's death she was quite ill and hysterical for a fortnight. Just before you came in she was crying like anything. And do you know what about, sir? Do you hear me, Liza? You listen. Simply because I was going out, and wished to leave her behind, and because she said I didn't love her so well as I used to in her mother's time. That's what she pitches into me for. Fancy a child like this getting hold of such an idea a child who ought to be playing at dolls, instead of developing ideas of that sort. The thing is, she has no one to play with here. Then, then, are you two quite alone here? Quite. A servant comes in once a day, that's all. And when you go out, do you leave her quite alone? Of course. What else am I to do? Yesterday I locked her in that room, and that's what all the tears were about this morning. What could I do? The day before yesterday she went down into the yard all by herself, and a boy took a shot at her head with a stone. Not only that, but she must needs go and cling on to everybody she met, and ask where I had gone to. That's not so very pleasant, you see. But I oughtn't to complain when I say I am going out for an hour, and then stay out till four in the morning, as I did last night. The landlady came and let her out. She had the door broken open. Nice for my feelings, eh? It's all the result of the eclipse that came over my life. Nothing but that, sir." "'Papa,' said the child, timidly and anxiously, "'now then, none of that again. What did I tell you yesterday?' "'I won't, I won't,' cried the child hurriedly, clasping her hands before her entreatingly. "'Come, things can't be allowed to go on in this way,' said Velchaninoff impatiently, and with authority. "'In the first place, you are a man of property 
how can you possibly live in a hole like this and in such disorder this place oh but we shall probably have left this place within a week and i've spent a lot of money here as it is though i may be a man of property and very well that'll do interrupted velchaninoff with growing impatience now i'll make you a proposition you have just said that you intend to stay another week perhaps two i have a house here or rather i know a family where i am as much at home as at my own fireside and have been so for twenty years the family i mean is the pogoryeltseffs alexander pavlovitch pogoryeltseff is a state councillor he may be of use to you in your business they are now living in the country they have a beautiful country villa claudia petrovna the lady of the house is like a sister like a mother to me they have eight children let me take liza down to them without loss of time they'll receive her with joy and they'll treat her like their own little daughter they will indeed velchaninoff was in a great hurry and much excited and he did not conceal his feelings i'm afraid it's impossible said pavel pavlovitch with a grimace looking straight into his visitor's eyes very cunningly as it seemed to velchaninoff why why impossible oh why to let the child go so suddenly you know of course with such a sincere well-wisher as yourself it's not that but a strange house and such swells too i don't know whether they would receive her but i tell you i'm like a son of the house cried velchaninoff almost angrily claudia petrovna will be delighted to take her at one word from me she'd receive her as though she were my own daughter deuce take it sir you know you are only humbugging me what's the use of talking about it he stamped his foot no no i mean to say doesn't it look a little strange oughtn't i to call once or twice first such a smart house as you say theirs is don't you see i tell you it's the simplest house in the world it isn't smart in the least bit cried velchaninoff they have a lot of children it will make another girl of her i'll introduce you there myself to-morrow if you like of course you'll have to go and thank them and all that you shall go down every day with me if you please oh but nonsense you know it's nonsense now look here you come to me this evening i'll put you up for the night and we'll start off early to-morrow and be down there by twelve benefactor and i may spend the night at your house cried pavel pavlovitch instantly consenting to the plan with the greatest cordiality you are really too good and where's their country house at the lisne but look here how about her dress such a house you know a father's heart shrinks nonsense she's in mourning what else could she wear but a black dress like this it's exactly the thing you couldn't imagine anything more so you might let her have some clean linen with her and give her a cleaner neck handkerchief directly directly we'll get her linen together in a couple of minutes it's just home from the wash send for a carriage can you tell them to let us have it at once so as not to waste time but now an unexpected obstacle arose liza absolutely rejected the plan she had listened to it with terror and if Velchaninoff had, in his excited argument with Pavel Pavlovitch, had time to glance at the child's face, he would have observed her expression of absolute despair at this moment. "'I won't go,' she said, quietly but firmly. "'There! Look at that! Just like her mamma. "'I'm not like mamma. I'm not like mamma. cried Liza, wringing her little hands in despair. "'Oh, papa! Papa!' she added if you desert me she suddenly threw herself upon the alarmed velchaninoff if you take me away she cried i'll but liza had no time to finish her sentence for pavel pavlovitch suddenly seized her by the arm and collar and hustled her into the next room with unconcealed rage for several minutes velchaninoff listened to the whispering going on there whisperings and seemingly subdued crying on the part of liza he was about to follow the pair when suddenly out came pavel pavlovitch and stated with a disagreeable grin that liza would come directly 
Velchaninoff tried not to look at him and kept his eyes fixed on the other side of the room. The elderly woman whom Velchaninoff had met on the stairs also made her appearance, and packed Liza's things into a neat little carpet-bag. "'Is it you are going to take the little lady away, sir?' she asked. "'If so, you are doing a good deed. She's a nice, quiet child, and you are saving her from goodness knows what here.' "'Oh, come, Maria Sisevna," began Pavel Pavlovitch. "'Well, what? Isn't it true? Aren't you ashamed to let a girl of her intelligence see the things that you allow to go on here? The carriage has arrived for you, sir. You ordered one for the Lisne, didn't you?' "'Yes. Well, good luck to you.' Liza came out, looking very pale and with downcast eyes. She took her bag, but never glanced in Velchaninoff's direction. She restrained herself, and did not throw herself upon her father, as she had done before, not even to say good-bye. She evidently did not wish to look at him. Her father kissed her, and patted her head in correct form. Her lip curled during the operation, the chin trembled a little, but she did not raise her eyes to her father's. Pavel Pavlovitch looked pale, and his eyes shook. Velchaninoff saw that plainly enough although he did his best not to see the man at all. He, Velchaninoff, had but one thought, and that was how to get away at once. Downstairs was old Maria Sisevna, waiting to say good-bye, and more kissing was done. Liza had just climbed into the carriage, when suddenly she caught sight of her father's face. She gave a loud cry and wrung her hands. In another minute she would have been out of the carriage and away, but luckily the vehicle went on, and she was too late. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Permanent Husband by Fyodor Dostoevsky This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Are you feeling faint?' asked Velchaninoff of his companion, frightened out of his wits. I'll tell him to stop and get you some water, shall I?" She looked at him angrily and reproachfully. "'Where are you taking me to?' she asked coldly and abruptly. "'To a very beautiful house, Liza. There are plenty of children. They all love you there. They are so kind. Don't be angry with me, Liza. I wish you well, you know.' In truth, Velchaninoff would have looked strange at this moment to any acquaintance, if such had happened to see him. "'How, how, how, oh, how wicked you are!' said Liza, fighting with suppressed tears, and flashing her fine, angry eyes at him. "'But, Liza, I—' "'You are bad, bad, and wicked!' cried Liza. She wrung her hands. Velchaninoff was beside himself. "'Oh, Liza, Liza, if only you knew what despair you are causing me!' he said. "'Is it true that he is coming down to-morrow?' asked the child haughtily. "'Is it true or not?' "'Quite true. I shall bring him down myself. I shall take him and bring him.' "'He will deceive you somehow,' cried the child, drooping her eyes. "'Doesn't he love you, then, Liza?' "'No. Has he ill-treated you, has he?' Liza looked gloomily at her questioner, and said nothing. She then turned away from him, and sat still and depressed. Velchaninoff commenced to talk. He tried to win her. He spoke warmly, excitedly, feverishly. Liza listened incredulously and with a hostile air. But still she listened. Her attention delighted him beyond measure. He went so far as to explain to her what it meant when a man took to drink. He said that he loved her and would himself look after her father. At last Liza raised her eyes and gazed fixedly at him. Then Velchaninoff began to speak of her mother, and of how well he had known her, and he saw that his tales attracted her. Little by little she began to reply to his questions, but very cautiously and in an obstinately monosyllabic way. She would answer nothing to his chief inquiries. As to her former relations with her father, for instance, she maintained an obstinate silence. While speaking to her, Velchaninoff held the child's hand in his own, as before, and she did not try to take it away. 
Liza said enough to make it apparent that she had loved her father more than her mother at first, because her father had loved the child better than her mother did. But that when her mother had died and was lying dead, Liza wept over her and kissed her, and ever since then she had loved her mother more than all, all there was in the whole world, and that every night she thought of her and loved her. But Liza was very proud, and suddenly recollecting herself, and finding that she was saying a great deal more than she had meant to reveal, she paused and relapsed into obstinate silence once more, and gazed at Velchaninoff with something like hatred in her eyes, considering that he had beguiled her into the revelations just made. By the end of the journey, however, her hysterical condition was nearly over but she was very silent and sat looking morosely about her, obstinately silent and gloomy, like a little wild animal. The fact that she was being taken to a strange house, where she had never been before, did not seem so far to weigh upon her. Velchaninoff saw clearly enough that other things distressed her, and principally that she was ashamed, ashamed that her father should have let her go so easily, thrown her away, as it were, into Velchaninoff's arms. "'She's ill,' thought the latter, "'and perhaps very ill. She has been bullied and ill-treated. Oh, that drunken, black-guardedly wretch of a fellow!' He hurried on the coachman. Velchaninoff trusted greatly to the fresh air, to the garden, to the children, to the new life now. As to the future, he was in no sort of doubt at all. His hopes were clear and defined. One thing he was quite sure of, and that was that he had never before felt what now swelled within his soul, and that the sensation would last for ever. "'I have an object at last. This is life,' he said to himself enthusiastically. Many thoughts welled into his brain just now, but he would have none of them. He did not care to think of details at this moment, for without details the future was all so clear and so beautiful, and so safe and indestructible. The basis of his plan was simple enough. It was simply this, in the language of his own thoughts. I shall so work upon that drunken little blackguard that he will leave Liza with the Pogori Eltsifs, and go away alone, at first. For a time, of course. And so Liza shall remain behind for me. What more do I want? The plan will suit him, too. Why else does he bully her like this? The carriage arrived at last. It was certainly a very beautiful place. They were met first of all by a troop of noisy children, who overflowed on to the front door steps. Velchaninoff had not been down for some time, and the delight of the little ones to see him was excessive. They were very fond of him. The elder ones shouted, before he had left the carriage, by way of chaff, "'How's the lawsuit getting on, eh?' And the smaller gang took up the joke, and all clamoured the same question. It was a pet joke in this establishment to chaff Velchaninoff about his lawsuit. But when Liza climbed down the carriage steps, she was instantly surrounded and stared at with true juvenile curiosity. Then Claudia Petrovna and her husband came out, and both of them good-humouredly bantered Velchaninoff about his lawsuit. Claudia Petrovna was a lady of some thirty-seven summers, stout and well-favoured, and with a sweet, fresh-looking face. Her husband was a man of fifty-five, a clever and long-headed man of the world, but above all a good and kind-hearted friend to any one requiring kindness. The Pogoryeltsev's house was in the full sense of the word a home to Velchaninoff, as the latter had stated. There was rather more here, however for, twenty years since Claudia had very nearly married young Velchaninoff, almost a boy at that time, and a student at the university. This had been his first experience of love, and very hot and fiery and funny and sweet it was. The end of it was, however, that Claudia married Mr. Pogoryeltsev. Five years later she and Velchaninoff had met again, and a quiet, candid friendship had sprung up between them. Since then there had always been a warmth, a specialty about their friendship, a radiance which overspread it and glorified their relations one to the other. There was nothing here that Velchaninoff could remember with shame. All was pure and sweet. 
and this was perhaps the reason why the friendship was specially dear to Velchaninoff. He had not experienced many such platonic intimacies. In this house Velchaninoff was simple and happy, confessed his sins, played with the children, and lectured them, and never bothered his head about outside matters. He had promised the Pogoryeltsevs that he would live a few more years alone in the world, and then move over to their household for good and all and he looked forward to that good time coming with all seriousness. Velchaninoff now gave all the information about Liza which he thought fit, though his simple request would have been amply sufficient here. Claudia Petrovna kissed the little orphan and promised to do all she possibly could for her, and the children carried Liza off to play in the garden. Half an hour passed in conversation, and then Velchaninoff rose to depart, he was in such a hurry that his friends could not help remarking upon the fact. He had not been near them for three weeks, they said, and now he only stayed half an hour. Velchaninoff laughed and promised to come down to-morrow. Someone observed that Velchaninoff's state of agitation was remarkable, even for him. Whereupon the latter jumped up, seized Claudia Petrovna's hand, and, under pretense of having forgotten to tell her something most important about Liza, he led her into another room. "'Do you remember,' he began, "'what I told you, and only you, even your husband does not know of it, about my year of life down at tea?' "'Oh, yes, only too well. You have often spoken of it.' "'No, I did not speak about it. I confessed, and only to yourself.' but I never told you the lady's name. It was Trusotsky, the wife of this Trusotsky. It is she who has died, and this little Liza is her child. My child. Is this certain? Are you quite sure there is no mistake? asked Claudia Petrovna, with some agitation. Quite, quite certain, said Velchaninoff enthusiastically. He then gave a short, hasty, and excited narrative of all that had occurred. Claudia had heard it all before, excepting the lady's name. The fact is, Velchaninoff had always been so afraid that one of his friends might some day meet Madame Trusotsky at tea, and wonder how in the world he could have loved such a woman as that, that he had never revealed her name to a single soul, not even to Claudia Petrovna, his great friend. "'And does the father know nothing of it?' asked Claudia, having heard the tale out. "'No. He knows, you see, that's just what is bothering me now. I haven't sifted the matter as yet,' resumed Velchaninoff hotly. "'He must know. He does know. I remarked that fact both yesterday and today. But I wish to discover how much he knows. That's why I am hurrying back now. He is coming to-night.' He knows all about Bagantov, but how about myself? You know how such wives can deceive their husbands. If an angel from heaven were to come down and convict a woman, her husband will still trust her, and give the angel the lie. Oh, don't nod your head at me. Don't judge me. I have long since judged and convicted myself. You see, this morning I felt so sure that he knew all, that I compromised myself before him. Fancy, I was really ashamed of having been rude to him last night. He only called in to see me, out of the pure unconquerably malicious desire to show me that he knew all the offence, and knew who was the offender. I behaved like a fool. I gave myself into his hands too easily. I was too heated. He came at such a feverish moment for me. I tell you, he has been bullying Liza, simply to let off bile, you understand. He needs a safety-valve for his offended feelings, and vents them upon any one, even a little child. It is exasperation and quite natural. We must treat him in a Christian spirit, my friend, and do you know I wish to change my way of treating him entirely. I wish to be particularly kind to him. That will be a good action on my part, for I am to blame before him. I know I am. There's no disguising the fact." Besides, once at tea, it so happened that I required four thousand roubles at a moment's notice. Well, the fellow gave me the money, without a receipt, at once, and with every manifestation of delight to be able to serve me. 
and I took the money from his hands, I did indeed, I took it as though he were a friend. Think of that! Very well, only be careful, said Claudia Petrovna. You are so enthusiastic that I am really alarmed for you. Of course Liza shall now be no less than my own daughter to me. But there is so much to know and to settle yet. Above all, be very careful and observant. You are not nearly careful enough when you are happy. You are much too exalted an individual to be cautious when you are happy," she added with a smile. The whole family went out to see Velchaninoff off. The children brought Liza along with them. They had been playing in the garden. They seemed to look at her now with even more perplexity than at first. The girl became dreadfully shy when Velchaninoff kissed her before all, and promised to come down next day and bring her father with him. To the last moment she did not say a single word, and never looked at him at all. But just before he was about to start she seized his hand and drew him away to one side, looking imploringly in his face. She evidently had something to say to him. Velchaninoff immediately took her into an adjoining room. "'What is it, Liza?' he asked, kindly and encouragingly. But she drew him farther away, into the very farthest corner of the room, anxious to get well out of sight and hearing of the rest. "'What is it, Liza? What is it?' But she was still silent, and could not make up her mind to speak. She stared with her motionless, large blue eyes into his face, and in every lineament of her little face was betrayed the wildest terror and anxiety. "'He'll hang himself,' she whispered at last, as though she were talking in her sleep. "'Who will hang himself?' asked Velchaninoff, in alarm. "'He will! He! He tried to hang himself to a hook last night,' said the child, panting with haste and excitement. "'I saw it myself. Today he tried it again. He wishes to hang himself. He told me so. He told me so. He wanted to, long ago. He has always wanted to do it. I saw it myself, in the night." Impossible, muttered Velchaninoff, incredulously. Liza suddenly threw herself into his arms, kissed his hands, and cried. She could hardly breathe for sobbing. She was begging and imploring Velchaninoff, but he could not understand what she was trying to say. Velchaninoff never afterwards forgot the terrible look of this distressed child. He thought of it waking and thought of it sleeping, how she had come to him in her despair as to her last hope, and hysterically begged and prayed him to help her. "'And to think of her being so deeply attached to him!' he reflected jealously, as he drove, impatient and feverish, towards town. She said herself that she loved her mother better. Perhaps she hates him and doesn't love him at all. And what's all that nonsense about hanging himself? What did she mean by that? As if he would hang himself, the fool! I must sift the matter, the whole matter. I must settle this business once and for ever, and quickly. End of chapter 6